Good morning, everybody. My name is Denny Klein. I have the privilege of being the chairman of the Meet the Mayors. This is my 12th year serving, and I'm so pleased to have you all here today. That's my staff. They get paid to do that, by the way. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to give a, a couple of special recognitions to, today. Um, is Heather Chankwin here still? Did she take off? I don't know if she's here because she's busy as a bee. She's been helping out, uh, coordinating uh, Meet the Mayors for the last few years. And she want to congratulate her on her new position as executive director of the Essex County Bar Association. Let's give a big hand. <laughs> now, there's a ton of mayors here. We have our county executive here. We have Pat Siebold here, as always, <laughs> one of my dear friends, and Essex County uh, changed. Commissioner, that's the new name, I, I'm behind the times. And we got a lot of very important people here, but there's important and there's important. I want to recognize a friend of mine who has been a very big help to meet the mayors by providing our national anthem. I'm speaking of no other than Pete Canarosi, the New Jersey Devils organist, and one of our state treasures, uh, I want to thank him again for his help with providing national anthems that we've done in the last few years uh, with Arlette. Now, please stand up, Pete. Let's go, Devils. For those Ranger fans out there, sorry. We had to win one last night. Okay. Now, as many of you know, um, this event has been about um, bipartisanship, diversity and inclusion, about being the voice of small business for Essex County, because this is a project of the Interchamber Coordinating Council, and especially about the link, the inextricable link between suburban and urban Essex County. And we have come so far, not only through this event, of bringing this county together under the leadership of Joe Tempesta, who is here and is going to make a remarks in a couple of a minute. But I first want to recognize some of our special sponsors that are here today. Um, our corporate sponsors, Greenbaum, Rowe, Smith, Davis, uh, represented by good friend Alan Prelgever. BCB Bank, Claudia is here somewhere, one of my dear friends. Jack Halpern for Best Rents New Jersey and Atlantic Realty. Uh, uh, Everton Scott for PSE&G. Uh, Vic Nichols for Plios. Uh, the ever-present and wonderful Lou LaSalle, who is here representing RWJ Barnabas <laughs> Cooperman <laughs> Barnabas. We also have the Paper Mill Playhouse as one of our sponsors. Uh, Smolin, uh, Carlos Ferrer is here from Smolin Accounting, and I'm, I'm, and I'm going to uh, say a quick hello to the staff of Ranfuer and Klein who are here today. Thank you all for being here. I also, right. also want to recognize the partnership of the Interchamber Coordinating Council, which is South Orange Maplewood, and by the way, congratulations on that merger. Uh, we have uh, the um, uh, Livingston Chamber of Commerce, North Essex Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Milburn Short Hills Chamber of Commerce, West Orange Chamber of Commerce. Also, uh, we have uh, Morgan Taylor Marketing uh, as one of our media sponsors, as well as Tap Into and uh, Suburban Essex Magazine, represented by my dear friend David Black, who's here. I want to thank all our sponsors for being part of this event. And I also want to recognize the um, sponsorship of the New Jersey League of Women Voters, 
I believe Jennifer Howard, I don't know if you're here, but if you are, stand up. And who is the president of the state chamber. And also Robin Weiss, who is the president of the Livingston Chamber. We have done this event for 13 years in coordination with the League of Women Voters, and we're very proud of that. All that being said, I want to introduce my dear friend, Lou LaSalle, who is going to take you to the next step of our program. Um, if any of you don't know Lou LaSalle, you've been hiding under a rock, I got to admit. It. Lou is my mentor. He's my role model. He's a, a person who has given so much to this community. Where are you, Lou? Come on over here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you again for coming today. My pleasure to introduce a person that will give the invocation, president of the Friendship Circle in Livingston and Lifetown, Rabbi Zalman Grossbaum. Rabbi. When my dear friend, Lou LaSalle, asked me to present the invocation this morning, I was honored, but actually very surprised. After all, even though I'm a rabbi, I am honored to run the Friendship Circle Lifetown in Livingston, an organization that helps children with special needs. But you see, I'm not a pulpit rabbi, and I don't give long sermons. Mm. So perhaps that's exactly why they asked me to speak this morning. <laughs> honored elected officials, community leaders, ladies and gentlemen. Jewish tradition teaches that there is a special power invoked when many join in unity. So please, join me in prayer. Master of the universe, creator of all things, we beseech you in your abundant mercy and infinite wisdom to bless this august assembly of distinguished leaders and conscientious citizens who have gathered this morning for the purpose of strengthening the well-being and growth of our communities. Endow all the esteemed members of this assembly with renewed motivation and inspiration to foster a spirit of mutual respect and cooperation in their dealings with one another, as well as with those whose lives will be bettered as a result of these noble pursuits. Implant within the hearts a desire to extend their hand in the spirit of brotherhood and compassion to those less fortunate than themselves, be it through the gifts of charity, or better yet, through that which Maimonides enumerates as the highest form of benevolence, the facilitation of resources that empower the individual to become self-sufficient. Almighty God, as you bestow your blessings upon the earth, we pray that there be no cause for your constraint, for your bounty, and that the goals and aspirations of your humble servants may be deemed worthy of their fullest realization. For we know all too well that if it were not for your personal provisions and providence, none of these things would come to pass. Let adversity not pervade our communities or our homes, and may our children never know the pangs of hunger or thirst, deprivation or disease. Please, almighty God, bless, guard, and protect the leaders of our great country and the members of the United States Armed Forces who are on the front line defending peace, liberty, and human dignity with the utmost loyalty and self-sacrifice. Especially during these very trying times, may God protect all peace-loving people from war and the threat thereof. And let me conclude with a blessing. Oseh shalom bimromav, he who made peace on high, who yaseh shalom aleinu, may he bring peace to us all, and may today's efforts of unity and support for one another hasten the dawning of an exactly such an era of true peace, harmony, and tranquility for all mankind. V'yimru amen, and let us say, Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. 
I'd like to introduce uh, for the first time the new mayor of West Orange, Susan McCartney, to help us with the salute to the flag. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to West Orange. Please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to uh, ask Vic Nichols, please come up. Um, and he's going to introduce the next part of our program. What a turnout. I'm going to make this very quick. It's funny, I, was, um, I got a chance to talk to uh, Joe DiVincenzo for about two minutes or two seconds before, and I said, I'm going to introduce you. And he said, um, you know, make it short. I said, I'm only going to say your name. <laughs> Okay, so I am going to just do that. Um, uh, Judge Vincenzo is going to come up to give us a welcoming, and then we're going to continue with the, with the program. See how easy that was? Good morning to everyone, to you, Danny. Uh, I'd like to thank you for all the support that you've given, not only to me as an individual, but to the chamber and what's been done here. I know it's a team effort, but you do a great job. And to each and every one of you, uh, thank you for what you're doing for Essex County and making sure you put our residents also first. You know, you got a great panel up here today. People ask me, I've been county exec for over 20 years now. And you know, I have a great team. I got great directors and staff team, 3,600 county employees that truly deserve the credit in changing this county what it is today. But the reason I am successful is because I have a great relationship with the 22 mayors in the town. Remember during COVID? Well, we were very proud what we did, our five vaccination sites. But there was constant communication with all 22 mayors. Uh, some of the mayors that are up here, you're going to hear from Mayor Roz Baraka, uh, who's done outstanding work in the city of North. You know, they talk about Flint, Michigan, about with lead pipes. Well, Mayor, you resolved that in 22 months, I think. We got it done. So I just want to Love thank you. Man. Mike Vieira. He has been running the Essex County Transportation Program for years, helping people that need to be helped. And I want to thank you, Mayor, uh, for everything you've done. Ted Green is, uh, if you go on Facebook, he's there every day. Green, he's there right? with the community. He makes sure he puts East Orange first, and he's a good friend. Sheena, right here. Uh, She does such an outstanding job in South Orange. I don't think everybody runs against her, but she works very, very, very hard. And when it comes to policies and issues, she's absolutely best. Tom and I go back a long time. And this young guy here, young. Joe like Tempestis, he is a, a good friend of mine. Uh, and we've done a lot of great things together. If you can see what's happened on Bloomfield Avenue, we're building the, the, the college up there, which is the Essex County College. And Joe's been very helpful. And we will have that project done by, uh, it will be done by July. You'll see uh, not only the building, but you'll see the parking lot, and you'll see the soccer field that I'm building behind here. And the good thing about all this, in the last five years, your taxes, the Essex County people that live here, it's only gone up 0.6, 6 tenths of a percent in five years. Yay. In 10 years, it's gone up 1.15. And the reason I tell you that, because you're in the business of helping people, but we have to do our job in government to be able to help you and make this county, make their towns beautiful so that you could even do more business and come here. So once again, Dennis, thank you. Sorry it's so long, but when I see these mayors, and I know we have a lot of mayors out there, we are one team here in Essex County. We're always putting Essex County first. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't want you to move. Again, nice and brief. <laughs> they asked me, Denny asked me, he said, please introduce Joe Tempesta and Joe DiVincenzo to give an award to someone who's very deserving of that award, which would be Mayor Baraka, um, <laughs> Mayor Rod Baraka. He, it's so, it's, so, it's so funny because they only gave me, they said, I want you to introduce those two people because they have the same name. So this way, you know, I, the two Joes. So without any further ado, gentlemen. Very nice. good, good. Thank you, Vic, thank you. Welcome everyone. Mayor Baraka, if you come up. So uh, Denny and, and the upper echelon of, of this austere group today that brought us together. Yeah. We'd like to present this to Mayor Baraka. And it says, in honor of Mayor Roz Baraka, for his leadership and advancement of Newark and Essex County, New Jersey, we'd like to present this award to you by the Meet the Mayor's Committee this day, March 31st, 2023. Congratulations. You know, Newark is where I was born and raised, went to public school there, and uh, Newark has gone through some good times, some bad times, just like every place else, in good times. All I can tell you, this guy works 24 hours a day, and he really puts his residents of Newark uh, first. And we have done many, many things together, and we're gonna continue to help each other. And I couldn't be more proud of Mayor Rods Baraka and what he has done and what he continues to do each and every day. I don't have much. Uh, I know we're gonna be on a panel, so just wanna say thank you. Uh, you know, I've, I've participated in this uh, since I became the mayor because I always thought it was important to be a part of what was going on uh, and make sure that Newark's voice was heard and the people in Newark uh, were represented. Uh, this thing is very heavy, by the way. <laughs> I don't know what this, you know, is part of my workout. But uh, I, I appreciate this and uh, this, the work we do in the city is really done by thousands and thousands of residents who live there every single day who are making the most uh, out of difficult times sometimes uh, and make uh, beautiful things out of things that people often uh, throw away and we make Newark beautiful as much as we possibly can and we work very, very, very hard to you know, make our city uh, one of the best cities in the state of New Jersey. So we're gonna keep working and keep pushing and God bless you and God bless the 311,000 people in the city of Newark. I warned him. I said, this, this is heavy. This is heavy. <laughs> better be prepared. Uh, I'd like to ask, now we're getting into the meat and potatoes today. With this, as, and by the way, Joe Tempesta, I gave you the best of me, my son Joey. As you well know, he's, he works over at the zoo. And I hope all of you have taken the time to go to the zoo, bring your family there, Bring your children and your grandchildren. I got married there. <laughs> Very nice. There are so many things that Joe D has done in partnership with our municipalities, in partnership with our mayor. I, did I say Joe D? Joe D? Joe D. Vincenzo. I hope I did. I say we got so many Joes here. Did I say you? Joe D. Vincenzo is a dear friend, and we so appreciate you've been here every year. And I want to thank you. Now I want to bring up Everton Scott, who is External Affairs Director of PSE&G, to introduce the panel and our moderator, Joe Tempesta. That I got right. <laughs> good, good, good morning, all. And uh, thank you, Jody, for doing my job for me. You did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we are a PSA team. We're delighted when we're involved in a session like this where we look out and we see all the, the faces. I recognize some of my old friends, old mayors, and uh, it's great to see you all here. 
we put together a really wonderful panel for you this morning, and I'm hoping through their discourse and through your input that we'll try to make a path forward for some of the problems that's impacting municipalities all across New Jersey. And so please feel, please feel free, make it interactive. Uh, when Danny comes up with a mic, ask questions, because these guys, uh, you never can tell what we might hear, and we might just hear something revealing. So from my far left, like Jody said, we had uh, Mayor Baraka from, from, from Newark, and then we have Mayor Michael Vera from uh, Livingston, Mayor Ted Green from the city of East Orange, and our only female mayor on the panel, Ms. Sheena Collum, village president from the village of South Orange. <laughs> And of course, then we have uh, Tom Bracken, who is the president of the state chamber. And of course, who can forget, Joe Tempesta, mayor of West Caldwell. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you. I love you. All right, good morning. So we have a lot to cover today. Uh, and I always try and get a topic, start off with a topic that's both relative to, to municipal governments as well as to local businesses, big or small. So tonight I thought, or today I thought we'd talk about some of the inflationary pressures that we're facing, and that means a lot of things for both sides, the private and public sector. So for example, for labor costs, you know, we, we're facing a, a big increase in New Jersey state health benefits. It also dovetails into contract negotiations, et cetera. So what I'd like to do is uh, maybe each ask each panelist, and I'll go right down uh, the panel, maybe you know, talk about uh, 60 seconds or less, some, a couple of highlights, what's happening in a respective municipality, and then talk about your comments on, on some of those inflationary pressures that you're facing. So, Mayor Baraka? Yep, I mean, uh, because of COVID itself, it already put you know, working people in a very difficult situation. I think service employees have now become essential employees, but, uh, you know, the, the cost of living has increased tremendously, which puts pressure on us around housing, uh, puts pressure on us around, you know, labor, trying to find people opportunities and jobs. And I don't think there's a labor shortage. I think, that, I think there's an investment shortage, right? So there are a lot of people who could participate in the labor pool who have been locked out and have been traditionally locked out. Now it becomes more important to get them involved in the economy immediately who've been locked out because of lack of skills and training and education or discrimination. And we need to get those people in, whether they're minorities or women, uh, you know, because everybody's talking about they can't find workers, but there are many, many people unemployed. And, and so that means that we have to target our workforce development very specifically on folks to get them trained in specific skills to prepare them for jobs that are available now for them to get our economy moving and going. And so we're trying to put a lot of focus on workforce and workforce training, particularly uh, for folks who are not traditionally engaged uh, in the workforce the way we need them to be. And so we've been doing that completely. We're focused on housing, trying to make sure we create enough housing. I mean, the housing stock that we have is old, we don't have enough housing, so we have to create more and more affordable housing uh, and concentrate on home ownership too. So we have a program where we're turning, turning people who were once uh, Section 8 holders or people who are part of public housing and giving them the opportunity to own homes. We're expanding that program to allow people 80% or below the AMI to get city property and own homes uh, as well. So we need to create home ownership to tackle this wealth gap that exists uh, in the state and also uh, put people, engage people more in the economy uh, in the city of Newark and in the state of New Jersey uh, for that matter. So mo most of the things that we're trying to do focuses completely on families and workers because inflation has affected all of us. The last thing I want to say is that I think that uh, the supply chain problem that we're having because of inflation is because we produce uh, very little of what we need. We produce just enough. Uh, in, in the global economy, uh, in the local economy, we, we produce uh, this idea of being efficient or being au or austerity, as they call it in Europe. We produce just enough. So when we, when we came to a crisis, we didn't have uh, what we needed. And so now prices are going up because we don't have enough. We have too much demand and not enough supply of the things that we have because we have not produced. If you even look at the hospital beds, right? So we created 
a, a specific number of hospital beds and we didn't have any reserve. And so when people got sick because of COVID and they went to the hospital, it overrun the hospitals because we didn't have enough beds because there's no reserve or no surplus. Uh, and business have been allowed to create uh, these situations where, is, where there is no reserve, there is no surplus. So now the demand uh, is higher than we're actually producing, which causes the, the inflation that we're seeing now. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. Mayor Vieira. Good. Thank you very much. And before I, I, I say anything, I do want to thank, uh, as, we, as we're starting to get out of, out of COVID, which I think in May uh, they're going to say there's an end to COVID, I, I do definitely have to thank uh, our county executive again, Joe DiVincenzo. Um, <laughs> Livingston was at the forefront of one of his COVID sites, and we we're very honored to uh, to have worked with Joe and uh, helping uh, protect uh, thousands and thousands of uh, Essex County individuals. But as we exit COVID now, we have other issues that that we're dealing with. Um, health uh, health insurance is going up 21 percent. Uh, we have a great town manager and a great CFO who are trying to work and, and trying to figure out how we're going to make our residents cover that 21% without them getting upset with us, without keeping us selected, honestly. Um, and and that, that's really, you know what, when you hit somebody's pocket, you know, they feel it. And that's going to hit somebody's pocket. And unfortunately, the state has not given us any money to recover that 21%. However, I know in Livingston, um, we're, we're coming up with ways to, to stay under that 2% cap. And uh, I do appreciate our, our town manager and our town CFO. But that's something that every municipality, probably in New Jersey, is going to uh, be affected by, is that 21%. You know, I, we're, in Livingston, we're a little bit different than some of uh, the other towns. You know, I hope we're going to talk about affordable housing uh, and the Fair Share Housing uh, Corporation because that really has been unfair to some towns. Um, and, and Livingston is, uh, is no different. Uh, we thought we had a, um, an agreement with Fish, Fair Share Housing. Uh, we had their signature on a piece of paper that said they agree with us. And then ver at the very last minute before the judge was going to issue his final order of protection, they all of a sudden said, no, we changed our mind. We want you to add more housing. And that was uh, that kind of hit us. And right now, we still don't have a uh, and, uh, a final order of protection. Um, and uh, uh, it's not fair. It, it really isn't. But um, the other uh, um, item that we're having uh, some difficulties with is our public works. We're definitely short some public works employees because there's a shortage of CDL drivers across the country. Um, don't know, uh, you know, a person gets a CDL and. Uh, you know, we think we have a, a decent salary for them, but then all of a sudden the Amazons and everybody else comes, knocks on their door with higher salaries, and all of a sudden they go to Amazon and, and, uh, and uh, UPS and uh, even New Jersey Transit in some cases, and, you know, we're short again. And there's a national shortage of CDL drivers. That's something that needs to be addressed, not just in New Jersey, but uh, uh, across the country. But uh, I'm looking forward to it again. I, I hope that we do touch on, uh, on uh, fair share housing and uh, maybe even cannabis. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Green. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to dive right into it. So I agree with both of the mayors, you know, uh, during this COVID and after the COVID has been a challenge, right? Um, we are in the city of East Orange right at this moment. We are in preparation of our budget and presenting the budget um, to the council and deliberating over um, a budget that when we looked at the budget this year and looking at all the expenses for medical, the bargaining unions and things that went up, it's going to be a challenge. And, and one thing as a municipality, you know, we have over 70,000 people in our community. And, you know, since I've been the mayor, we had a, a flat budget. You know, we uh, try very hard when we look at our team strategically, try to find ways to never put the burden on the taxpayer and people, right? So this year alone, as the mayor said, we, we're being challenged because we found out this year we may have to have 0.3 increase, right? Because, you know, things have changed. We, we looked at the market of, of folks now. When, when the mayor's talked about um, hiring people, you know, people have became in demand, right? Meaning that when there was a, a, a maintenance person where you can get that person at maybe 95,000 a year, 
Now they're asking for 125, 140, 150. And we're trying to make sure that when we look at making sure that the services through our city doesn't change, I agree with the mayors, we have to find a way. And that 2% cap, we do have to look at that. You know, we had an opportunity to meet with urban mayors this week down in Washington and talk to some of our legislators about some of the issues going on in the city of East Orange. But one thing we, we're very proud of is that um, our redevelopment that is going on in the city of East Orange. We have close to uh, $2.1 billion invested in the city of East Orange, right? Yes. And, and, and through those developments, which we have a major project is that is going to change the face of East Orange, which is a $500 million project, which we know for a fact that would put tax rateables back into our city, which we're finding ways through that project, uh, through our at-risk program to make sure that, as the mayor talked about, job opportunities, we, we're training um, young people to have a future in that development because it's a two-phase development. So again, there are challenges. We, we have jobs that have started and they're moving a little slow because of supplies and you know trying to find uh, folks to get these supplies into the city. But I think that we're very optimistic about uh, the direction that we're, we're going in the city. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> we have, uh, Village President, Mayor Cullum. Hi, good morning, everybody. So the first thing I wanted to say is, especially because it's the end of March, is happy Women's History Month! I want to do a special shout out, especially looking into this audience. I am seeing so many women entrepreneurs, business owners, women in government, women in public service, women in the private sector, but it's meet the mayor. So I want to do a special shout out to the first woman mayor of West Orange, Mayor Susan McCartney. <laughs> And I don't know if she's in the audience, but also Milburn Mayor Maggie Miggins, are you here? There she is, right there. Pleasure serving with two other um, amazing women mayors in Essex County. Okay, so on the inflation front, right, it's very difficult. We were looking at a surge of over 6% for such a long time. 6% inflation, trying to keep to a 2% cap, which by the way, I'm not even sure Republicans, Democrats, why we even refer to the cap anymore. Back in the day, there was actually provisions that gave municipalities the tools to control spending. Once those went away, the cap didn't, we just started calling things cap exemptions or it's outside of the cap, et cetera. The reality is most municipalities cannot deliver budgets at 2%. So on top of the inflationary environment where we know even just past December, we're gonna be looking at two to 4% on top of what was already a surge is what one of the mayors had also referenced was the state health benefits plan. South Orange year or month over month is now looking at 24% increase. It is a sizable, sizable component of our municipal budgets. Think about it this way. Healthcare is so expensive in the state of New Jersey that a family plan for a public employee is $40,000. Right. And based on their salary and what the municipality covers, even at their top, we're spending $30,000 per employee. So we know first and foremost, we need relief for people in that plan or else the entire state health benefits plan is gonna collapse. We've seen some of the largest cities decide to get away from that plan. So if we're gonna reinvest back into it, Governor Murphy needs to use part of that $10 billion surplus to ease the pain for our taxpayers. We heard, yeah, can you guys clap because that's really important. He does have $350 million in his proposed budget to go towards us, but that is not gonna hit until the 2024 fiscal cycle, so we're not gonna realize it right now in this budget. The next thing that I would say is really important that everybody should be advocating for, and I'm sure our friends at PSE&G understand this, is energy tax receipts. It's like, Sheena, what are you talking about? I can tell you right now that municipalities should be receiving almost double, if not triple, the amount of money that they get in state aid from the state of New Jersey. Um, 
Municipalities used to be the collection energy for energy tax receipts. I mean, here in South Orange, we have a $45 million operating budget. We're getting about $1.4 million of uh, the total, and we should be over $3 million. That's $2 million, six percentage points, for municipalities significantly bigger than mine, as you can see to the left of me, is millions of dollars being withheld from our local towns, especially when we have state health benefits plan increases, especially when we're in an inflationary environment. Think about six tax percentage points in your municipality to be able to reinvest into small businesses, into affordable housing, into infrastructure. Last but not least, many of us who are not owned by a private utility are looking at a two-year identification process for lead line replacement, a very admirable goal. 10 years to, to do a full sweep of lead line replacement. We are put into such a challenging position where if we assess the homeowner side of those lead line replacements, property owners could be looking at close to $10,000 per replacement. We know that exact amount because that's what it's taking private utilities to make those replacements. So much like the mayors have said, this might be the single worst budget for municipalities and school districts who also felt the uh, impacts of what I would call unfunded mandates. Um, I would have to disagree a little bit with Mayor Baraka on an investment shortage. I think Essex County and our communities need to be ready for bold change. People are ready to deliver housing and housing opportunity. And if you get behind the idea of changing in your community that we need growth, that we are collectively in planning area one, which demands growth, we have incredible access to mass transit. We have incredible schools. Everything that we've said about Jody running the county, exceptional, which means that Essex County needs to provide its fair share of more housing opportunities. There are hundreds of thousands of homes that are in a deficit throughout the state of New Jersey. What role are we going to play in Essex County in helping meet those housing demands? Because each person who buys a home in one of our cities, one of our towns, one of our villages, those are shoppers, those are diners, those are people who are going to be patronizing our small businesses. This is all cyclical. We are all interconnected. And I would say that the last thing that I would say is that this is our opportunity when costs are going up, there's price gouging, this is where we need to talk about shared services. This is where we need to have a real conversation about con consolidations. As you know, South Orange and Maplewood just recently had our first uh, fire merger, second highest line item in our budget, and we already saw the uh, cost differential of close to $1.5 million in savings in year one. That's not money that we take lightly. We get to reinvest back into public safety just more efficiently. So I welcome working with other mayors in Essex County as we address stormwater, as we address how we can work together to build economic development in the region, how we look at tax sharing to really bring a brighter future to all of us collectively, because it does take that team. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So we're very, uh, very fortunate to have the president of the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce, Tom Bracken, here today. And, and Tom and I were talking before. I said we'd talk about we'll start off with inflation, but he mentioned something about uh, something that's looming that you've uh, heard about on the news recently with this banking couple of banks that collapsed. Yeah. And uh, he had some interesting comments I'd like you to share with everyone. But go ahead, Tom, and sure. share with us from a business Thank you. perspective. <clears throat> Not sure why I'm here. I'm the odd man out, but I'm very happy to be here, and it's a great turnout. And uh, I, I think the the message I would bring to everybody here is that uh, you know New Jersey is a very uh, interesting state. The only way you can really get things done in New Jersey is have strong collaborations with different groups in the state. No specific group, no specific company can really make a difference and get things done unless they have strong allies as part of a, a collaboration. Um, we work very hard with developing those collaborations with the League of Municipalities, which encompasses all of you mayors, uh, the governor's office, the legislature, the business community, and we try to come up with common issues that will help everybody. And everything that the mayors have said you know, there's one common factor, it's money. Money is the issue. And the biggest problem that we have right now is that we have a state that has probably the greatest demographics in the country, probably the greatest collaboration of assets in the country, the best location for business in the country, 
and we rank 48th out of 50 in business competitiveness. Mm -hmm. That gap is disgusting. And why are we there? Uh, Overregulation of the business community, uh, com uh, continuous attacks on the business community by different groups. The, the thing about business is that business, you know, is 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 the heart of small business, medium-sized businesses, and large businesses. That's the heart of New Jersey. That's the heart and soul of New Jersey. That's where the jobs are. You can't discount that. And in this state, with the uh, crisis we have in, in many contexts, our business community, don't forget, during the pandemic was shut down. It was closed, the first in the country. We started to overcome all those issues. Then we got hit with inflation, worker shortage, uh, supply chain issues. You can go on and on about the issues. And the businesses, businesses are climbing out of that. Then enter SVB and the banking crisis. So things were going like this, and now they've gone like this. And it's something that we have to deal with in the state very aggressively because we have a budget right now that's being debated in the legislature. It's about $52 billion. A lot of that budget is from money that we will never get back again. The federal money that came into to New Jersey uh, from the pandemic. And we have to find a replacement for that money. And, the, and, you know, I think you all know, and you've heard the governor say this, we've had three or four bond rating increases in the state of New Jersey, which were very complimentary about we've made full pension payments, uh, we're investing, we have a reserve, all those good things. But in each of those four bond rating issues at the very end, which nobody's focusing on, it says if we don't find a way to have sustainable, reliable, growing uh, income, we are going to be in, at risk of having all those bond ratings decrease. The only way to have reliable, sustainable income is to improve our economy. The only possible way you can do that. So we work very hard on a daily basis to try to make things better for New Jersey. I, I would tell you that it's getting a little better. It, it isn't great. It's getting better. We still have many issues we're dealing with. But um, please understand that the business community is there to help all of you. It's there to be um, the primary source of all the philanthropic giving that goes to all the not-for-profits in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. We are not the enemy. We should be a strong partner with all of you because together we can get a lot more done. And even though we, there's not a lot of focus on the business community in the press because really there's no press anymore, uh, we are constantly under siege by groups that just want to vilify the business community when in fact I, I really take exception to all that, and we've called several of those organizations out. So my message is, I hope I'm here to uh, form a stronger collabor a collaboration with all of you, because that strong collaboration can get things done. We need to improve our economy if we're going to survive as a state, and if the programs you're talking about right now are not only grown, but sustained. So thank you for inviting me, and um, I appreciate the opportunity. Can I? Can I? All right, so yeah, I could say a couple of things, Denny. I, I kind of I think Mayor Collum actually hit most of my remarks. Uh, <laughs> and as my, my dear friend and, and where I work full time in East Hanover, Mayor Panulo and I always say it's a very delicate balancing act to try and provide all of the services, for example, that Sheena and Roz talked about and Ted, uh, but doing it at a fair number that doesn't chase our people out of town and keep your taxes reasonable. Very difficult. Uh, somebody mentioned about, uh, I think Mayor Vieira, about, about labor. Very difficult. We can't get, we can't get, never mind CDL drivers, we can't even get a laborer to work. Uh, we've raised, you know, the starting salary. It's still not enough. Uh, we used to get 50, 60 applicants for one job, but we're now, we're lucky if we get one. Uh, it's really scary. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all in this together. And I think as Tom said, you couple that with what's happening in the business world and again, dovetailing into inflation. What I want to do, Denny, is I want to take Q&A on this topic that we just yes. talked about with inflation, because if I get into the next one, it'll take us to 12 o'clock. And, and I, I, I hesitate to bring that one up. Wow, what a panel, huh?
is Morgan Taylor here somewhere? Morgan, are you here? Do we have a wireless mic? Okay, well, in the meantime, <laughs> normally we have a wireless mic, and at the last minute we found out that we needed to uh, bring in an outside company to do our, uh, oh, we have a wireless mic, good. Because this is the part where I get to wander through the audience and pick on mayors and make them talk and stuff. And uh, what I want to start off with, though, is, Morgan, if you would please, uh, thank you so much for being here. If you would do me a favor and bring this over to uh, the mayor of uh, West Orange, Susan McCartney, I'd like you to start off with any questions or comments. Fine job on that Pledge of Allegiance, huh? <laughs> wait, wait. I do not have any questions uh, at this moment. Uh, our budget has not been introduced yet, and I have I have been elected all of three months. So God bless you. Uh, God bless you. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Um, our budget has not been introduced. It is going to be a very difficult budget, as you've all mentioned, um, and it has not been presented to our council yet. So I'm in the same position you are. Uh, struggling, a lot of uh, unfunded mandates that uh, we have to work out too. Well, you know so, what, you've been yes, sir. Sleeping good lately. After this budget, you won't be. <laughs> <laughs> I sent a text to my former mayor, Robert Preece, and I think it's mind-boggling <laughs> that he was in office for 12 years. Yeah. So, <laughs> though I was on the council for 20 years. Yes, I know. Congratulations. <laughs> Pat Siebold, everybody. This is really important, and it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. <laughs> Today's Meet the Mayors is hosted by Denny Klein. This is the last time he's going to be doing it. He's been doing it for many, many years, and I think we have to pay. I think we really have to pay tribute to Denny for all the wonderful work that he has done. So thank you so much. Even though you won't be doing this anymore, you'll find something important to do. So thank you, Denny. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Pat. You're, you're one of our treasures, and you've been here, and, and every year I so appreciate it. Um, I am not uh, uh, leaving. I'm still going to be part of the committee. Yeah. Now, I want to take my uh, uh, chairman's privilege. This is Jack Halper. Hi. Uh, I'm a real estate developer here in New Jersey, and I just want to remind everybody that real estate taxes fund funds what you do. Right. And there's a temptation always to be wonderful and, and lower and lower and lower the renewal rate on a rental apartment. That's very popular, but it'll destroy your budgets. It's been tried all over the world, and every single time, it's a failure. It leads to bankruptcies of towns, and when they're, in a particular time when there's inflation, you need more money, and our inflation is going up too. If you do it too much, Developers won't maintain their properties. It's a terrible, terrible move, and I would caution you against doing that. Uh, Josh, are you here? Josh Raymond, are you still here? Okay, it didn't happen. Um, I want to turn this over to uh, Alan Prelgever, another one of our sponsors. Yes. Hi. Um, I grew up in Maplewood, South Orange, and uh, so. I understand shared services because Danny lived in South Orange, I lived in Maplewood, we attended the same school district. I'm going to raise a subject that nobody's raised here, but it impacts inflation, it impacts every community in New Jersey, and that's home rule. As much as we all love home rule, the fact is that home rule, which is the elephant in the room, costs New Jerseyans billions of dollars every year because there are no shared services, That's which right. means, by the way, and I, I live in Mendham now, we have Mendham Borough and, and Mendham Township, and we have a separate 
judiciary. We have separate police, separate fire, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, firemen, and it costs a fortune. Every school superintendent That's in New right. Jersey makes two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and you pay for the ones that are retired as well. That's right. We can't afford the pension benefits. We can't afford the medical benefits forever for everybody. So I asked this panel, what can we do about home rule? I love New Jersey. My kids live in New Jersey. I practice in New Jersey. I love it. But we need to really address this elephant in the room. Yeah, Thank I, I would like to, that plus some other things I want to address. I don't know if people know there are actually more superintendents in the state than there are actually mayors. <laughs> of, uh, uh, you know, there, honestly, there's probably 100 more superintendents than actually mayors of cities, uh, which is, uh, you know, causing, we always complain about our taxes, but that's what we're paying for. We're, we're paying for, for that, and as well as all the other things that you just mentioned, police chiefs, superintendents, uh, you know, uh, fire, everyone. Uh, we pay for these things because we, we like to be in control of the little small fiefdoms that we have, and we have to become more democratic, actually, and begin to share some of these services across counties uh, and across municipalities. It's important for us to do that. It's almost, you know, there, there are some districts that have one school, right, uh, as a school district itself with a principal and a superintendent, which really makes no sense at all. There, there are places that have two firehouses uh, for a, 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 a city that if the next city did, could actually do the fire service in their city, because it's right next, right across the street, by the way, right? So all of those things need to be addressed, but I think we have a tendency uh, of living uh, under what we've used to live with for years and years and years and years, so we think that this is okay. Uh, and then the tension between business and community, it's important for, to create, a, create an environment where businesses do well. In Newark, we try to create an environment where businesses have an opportunity to grow, to thrive, where there's development happening. But the tension is, look, in, in, in the country, the five largest insurance companies made $11 billion in profit in the second quarter in 2021, right? And that was a decrease from what they made in 2020. Right In the middle of the pandemic, they made the most money because we weren't going to the doctor, but we were still paying our premiums, right? That money was not reinvested in the economy. It was not reinvested in people's pockets. It was not given to home or, uh, homeowners. We weren't given rebates. We weren't given the million dollars of rebates that uh, uh, Obamacare talked about. None of that stuff happened. And so while they made money, our insurance premiums are going up in New Jersey, right? So you're talking about insurance companies who made super profits who are now raising their premiums on workers in 2022 and 2023 that are going to affect our municipal budgets. And nobody says anything about that. We just make a deal where they don't have to, where we don't go up on our premiums for two years. And then a third year, they double the premium because of the two years that they missed, which is what's happening statewide. And so Newark pulled out of the state insurance uh, plan. Why? Because we have to. We can't tell workers that they have to pay a 21% increase uh, in their medical benefits. It's ridiculous for us to ask people to do that, right? And nobody is saying that insurance companies should invest in our economy, invest in our community. That's exactly what should happen. Uh, and, and I wanted to reiterate the issue about us, because we keep saying this over and over again that they're not enough workers. There are a lot of women who want to be CDL drivers. We should train them. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are a lot of... There are people who can't get jobs. They can't get jobs because they're telling them they don't have a driver's license. That's ridiculous. They're, they're undocumented folks that we can train and put to work. It's, it does not make sense for us to keep saying this with all these people out here that want to work, that don't have access to the, to the labor pool, don't have access to the market. We can get them in the labor pool and, and, and even out the amount of money we have to pay. Uh, if you got people who saying they want $150,000 now, that's because they're the only guy in, uh, in town. There are about 500 other people that want that job, that need that job, who are not allowing to work for various things that make no sense at all. And we need to get rid of that. Look, we can't hire secretaries in some fields in a, in a place because they're asking everybody to have a bachelor's degree or beyond just to answer the phone. You got to have a bachelor's degree or beyond. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Give the people the credentials and the training to get the work. And that's what I mean by 
having investment in, the, in these people to make sure we pull them into the labor pool, which to me helps the economy. Because the more people have money in their pocket, the more they get to spend on the economy. And then you make money. And guess what? You don't have no uh, problem with people paying your rents because they're making money to pay the rent, right? And we have to make sure that we give people the opportunity to pay rent. Giving people $15 uh, uh, in, in their salary does not cause inflation. It's ridiculous, it's never been true. We need to stop saying that, give people the money that they need so they can participate in the economy and give them access to jobs. Um, where's our uh, M Milburn mayor, is she here still? She's here. Where are you? Up here. Oh, I'm gonna come right back to you. I'm well, how are you? Um, After she. So, in Milburn, we're not experiencing everything. We, we are starting to look at our budget, and I think um, we're going to go up half a penny. That's it, half a penny. And we haven't raised taxes in the last two years on a local level. Um, I'm thrilled about that. I think uh, we have a fabulous business administrator and a fabulous CFO, and I don't know how they've worked it all out, but they have, and, um, and we have great people running our um, budgets. And Annette Romano's here with me as well. She's one of our uh, uh, newly elected, another woman, yay, uh, yay. township committee <laughs> woman. So we are not seeing um, the problems that you all are seeing. And I don't know why that is. I just know that. And I know we give a lot of money to the county, too. I think, you know, we pay a lot of high taxes in Milburn, and we have a lot of services. And I don't believe we should be cutting services. We have we have a fire department, we have a police department, we like that. We're, we don't want to merge with anybody. We do like that little bit of a hometown feel. So I'll, I'll have to disagree with you, Mr. Menda man. Um, but I do believe, um, and as far as, as far as all these rental properties, Mr. Alpert, was it? Mr. Alpert, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Um, I sell real estate for a living. I'm a real estate broker. Mm -hmm. And the way you build wealth is through home ownership. It's not through rentals. So when I look at something like you saying rentals, that's all well, fine and good because People are building wealth for you, but they're not building wealth for themselves. I think it's important when we're looking at real estate that we look at building wealth for people, for people. And you do that by buying real estate. You don't do it by paying somebody else's mortgage. Thank you. Well, one of the things that we certainly recognize is that the environment here is for an exchange of ideas, a bipartisan exchange. We don't have to agree with each other. We have to work together to find our solutions. And one of the people that's working on those kinds of solutions, who represents one of the most important towns in our community, is Sean Spiller, mayor of Montclair. Hey, Denny. Well, Denny. You. After Sean's done, Sheena has a few comments she likes. Go for it. Well, uh, good morning, and uh, you know, certainly glad I'm here today. This is interesting, right? Got fun. <laughs> um, Sean Spiller, Mayor of Montclair, and uh, certainly I want to say to all of you, thank you for being here. Uh, to Jody, uh, certainly going through the pandemic, I want to say a big thank you as well. That was, uh, it was a challenging time, certainly for me, and I know many of you, but uh, really that leadership helped. A little bit of what we we're talking about now, I'd, I'd put to each and every one of you as, as mayors. You know, we're seeing in Montclair right now a few things coming together that we're mindful of as we plan budgets for the future, and I'm wondering how you're looking to address this. We're all looking at the federal dollars that we know have a, a short lifespan here in, in terms of what we're seeing. We see that the state uh, is going to be facing challenges, uh, even if we're talking about infusion of dollars uh, in the near term to help offset health care costs, those dollars are going to dry up as well, and then you're going to be left with that cliff uh, uh, when that comes forward. Um, we see that even with schools, S2 funding and other pieces as well, where the dollars that are being put in, offsetting some costs now, but challenges are moving forward. When we look at our budget as well, the other thing that we're facing is that uh, things have changed in terms of the way people are working. Right, Montclair with our five train stations, people are commuting less into the city, there's working from home, we're seeing you know, some of those lots use lists, we're seeing uh, changes in lifestyles that are impacting us and they impact our budgets and where we put our funding priorities. How are each of you addressing for the challenges that you're seeing in each of your uh, municipalities, cities, um, going forward to say, over the next you know, three to five years, uh, how are your budgets gonna change? How are you gonna manage the loss of those federal and state dollars? And then specifically, what are you doing in terms of the changing lifestyles that you're seeing from, from people working and, and how are you accommodating for that or planning for that for the future moving forward? It, uh, Danny, can I just make a comment, please? about the shared services issue and, and some of what uh, sure. Sean just said. And I know that Sheena wants to make some comments. Um, you know, one of the ancillary problems with um, home rule that is going to be very impactful to New Jersey 
is we're about to get $12 billion of federal infrastructure money. And um, as we get that, if we don't use it, we lose it. That's right. Infrastructure money has always been a great boom to the economy. It has turned economies around over the years. And this $12 billion that we're getting could do that for New Jersey. The biggest problem we have with utilizing those dollars, and this is coming from Diane Scacchetti, the Department of Transportation Commissioner, is that we have between municipal, county, and state uh, rules and regulations and permitting issues, a morass of issues that are gonna prevent a lot of these projects from getting done in a timely way. If we can't get them done, the projects, uh, we lose the money, we're gonna lose a huge potential benefit to our economy. So um, just, that's just one of the issues we have with the, uh, the home rule issue. And I can tell you at the federal level, the 12 billion, the overall infrastructure dollars that are coming to the states, you know, as I said, we're getting 12 billion. They are working in Washington to streamline their permitting to give them to the states in a streamlined way then it's up to the state to streamline theirs, because if we don't, we lose the money. So just one added aspect of uh, home rule. Sheena, I think you had some comments you wanted to make. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry, sir, what was your name? The, you, you talked about... Alan Krause. I, Alan, I just wanna get a matching best friend tattoo with you right now. Um, I, I, I agree with you 100%. Oh. Um, I will tell you, uh, it's the ongoing joke, I, I ran for mayor to dissolve the position. My position does not need to exist one bit. My community is amazing, I'd like to believe that I do a good job, but the reality is, is we're two and a half square miles. We have 18,000 residents. We live right next to a sister community, Maplewood, I see our deputy mayor of Maplewood, Deb Angle. Uh, they are three and a half square miles. They have 25,000 uh, 25, residents. Why can't we be one community? The reality is, is that mayors are not gonna let go of this special little meet them this little thing right here that makes us feel so important and that we're called mayor and that people love us and it feels really, really good. Well, hopefully they love us. When we go to the League of Municipalities and we get the little badge that says mayor and we're like, puff, puff, like it feels really good. But when you think about it, there's 564 municipalities. What the hell are we doing? We have strong state government, then we have strong county government, then we have strong municipal government, and we are paying for inefficiencies non-stop. Literally, my, thank my community just did a master plan thinking about land use for two and a half miles, right? Maplewood is in the process of doing their master plan. Mayor Roz Baraka has an award-winning master plan thinking about their land use that's going on right now. Why are we not coordinating and letting go some of this home rule, it's us and us alone? I heard Mayor Mag uh, Miggins talk about Milburn wants their services, but there's a price to that, right? Milburn's average property taxes are over 20,000 a year. I know in Livingston, you're at about 17,000. In South Orange, we're approaching $19,000. Is this sustainable? Is it sustainable that we have of a police chief in two different jurisdictions, which all in net cost is over $300,000 for taxpayers, fire chiefs, et cetera. You have to have those type of conversations. And if it's not going to be compelled by the state, then at the local level, we need to start talking about our inefficiencies. I told you, our fire department, two fire departments, we reduced five people as a part of a consolidation, and it's saving $1.7 million. For anybody to to add that up, that's a boatload of tax percentage points that go back to students, mental health, recreation, et cetera. As, and, and I'll just end by saying, how many of us have special improvement districts, right? SIDS, BIDS, where we're trying to support our local businesses in a very micro way. What does it look like when towns come together, merge, consolidate, share services, and we build massive departments of economic development for small businesses? We have so much opportunity to leverage and scale together. When, when a business comes to South Orange and there's not an opportunity, I wanna be able to say, Ted, Mike, Roz, 
We don't have space, but I bet you guys do. Let's figure out a way to get these guys open. That level of collaboration will change New Jersey because I will remind you as a very progressive Democrat, we are number one in the country in property taxes and we're not gonna get in investment if we are unaffordable and uncompetitive in this business market. Now, I just want to say to our mayors, don't hold back. Tell us how you really feel. Come on. Is, is Mike Venezia still here from so, Bloomfield? No, Mike? Well, uh, I, we're running out of time. Is there any mayor I haven't gotten to that wants to speak? Okay, I'm going to turn over our last question to Vivian Fraser from the Urban League. Hey, good morning, everyone. Morning. I just want to recognize the mayor of Newark, Raz Baraka, where our offices are located. But we're, I, I represent the Urban League of Essex County, so we serve all of your towns. Uh, but my question really is about the opportunity gap and access to education and training as an issue I know you're all intimately aware of. How should we think about ensuring that everyone has an opportunity to be part of a diverse workforce of the future. I'd like to hear from each of the mayors. Thank you. All right. Um, I forgot what we was talking about. <laughs> it's a lot, lot going on in the room. But I do want to, um, I want to piggyback on um, what the mayor from Newark said in terms of how we have to think outside the box, right? Um, and and it's, a, it's a true fact that we do. When I walked in office in 2018, uh, with my team, I, and I told my team, I said, listen, we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to get to work. And we're going to have to learn how to do more with less. One of the things I looked at where I talked about campaigning and how fair it was in terms of people's salaries. When I walked in the door, I asked my business administration to pull um, folks' salaries. And what I looked at where there was people in our administration that was making $37,000 a year. And I looked at the, the economy and I looked at the housing stock. It's no way none of us in this room, if we had to live off $37,000 a year, we won't be able to live. So my goal was through our budget, through our CDBG money through our investments in the city, every one of those employees that was making 37,000, I pushed their salaries up to 42,000. And I said, and, and I know it was a tough fix because I felt that there's no way we're gonna get the production out of these employees the way we get out of ourselves. And I, I felt that it was unfair as a mayor that I can walk in and I make six figures. It wasn't, it wasn't fair to me as a individual who grew up in a city that gave me an opportunity to not give these folks an opportunity. And we found the money. We found the money because we felt that these individuals have been working 15, 20, and I didn't, I didn't understand that how, when the cost of living goes up, that their salaries wasn't going up. Even though we had a bargaining unit and we worked with them in 2%, 3%, it wasn't matching. And I can tell you, with us thinking outside the box and found reasonable ways to pull people's salaries up, we see the residuals now. We're seeing that our uh, absentee from folks coming to work, because most people was working, what, two jobs to make ends meet. And I had to put that out there because a lot of times, as mayors, there's decisions that we have to make, and there's tough decisions. And I have to commend my council because they brought into that deal. And, and we're very proud of it because now, you know, there's no way in the economy that we live in, and we all know that, that no one with a parent with two kids making that type of money could even survive. They just can't. So we're very proud of that uh, uh, movement that we did in that initiative. I do just want to talk about very quickly when we talk about opportunities, right? We have created a, a at-risk program where we're working with our local school district. And what we're doing now, we are working with uh, young men and young ladies in the school system. 
where we are, are identifying young people who are opting out to go to college. Now, we're not discouraging them from going to college. We're not doing that. But we are investing in them in terms of apprenticeship pr training programs, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, um, anything to do with a trade right now. We're working with our local unions here in the city of East Orange. We have over 37 young men right now. They're traveling down to South Jersey and they're in an apprenticeship program where once they finish that apprenticeship program, we are creating opportunities through that $500 million project that we have in the city of East Orange. We're not allowing any developer, any contractor to come into my community and our community don't benefit. And our young people have to benefit because they are the future. We're seeing a program in terms of training is second to none right now. We have, in our DPW department, we have hired over 15 young men and young ladies in that department. We are going after the young people in our community that we feel that may not have another opportunity. We have our own water department. We are putting young people through um, programs and classes where we're finding the money. We're, we're finding the money. I tell my uh, team all the time, if we can find money for other things, we can find money to invest in our future and those are our young people. So I just wanted to put that out there because I think it's so important that sometimes we can't depend on government. We have to be able to be very creative. Now, when, when government give us the money and grant us the money, I'm fine with that because we do have relationships with our governor. We have relationship with T Lieutenant Governor and Brittany Timberlake and other folks. And I'm always asking for money. But as a mayor, we always create in our own opportunities. When I walked in very quickly, we had over 1,000 vacant and abandoned properties offline. After we looked at our inventory, I gave my team a task. And one of the tasks was to make sure that to put those properties back online. So as of today, we went from 1,000 properties offline, right, making sure that we build our tax roll, now we're down to close to 167 properties offline. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, and thank you, those of you wonks who have stayed for this, because I think you've seen that this has been a really pithy program. Um, this is the kind of thing that we need to do together. We don't have to always agree, but we have to work together to find solutions. I think we talked about diversity and inclusion. We've seen that today. We've talked about bipartisanship. We've talked about really being respectful to hearing everybody's voice and seeing everybody here. And what I am going to ask our New Jersey State President, Tom Bracken, to do is to work with our local chambers in leading a lobbying effort to get the state of New Jersey to help find relief for our municipalities, to help find creative solutions to these problems, to work together. We obviously have a lot of problems. And that being said, I want to wrap up the program and thank you all for being here. Thank our sponsors, our chamber sponsors, our media sponsors. Uh, Morgan, if you're here, hopefully we can get a couple of photographs at the end. Um, and now I want to introduce Vic Nichols, um, as you've heard, Pat, you sort of took my thunder, but this is, has been my 12th year chairing, and um, the most important thing for me is to see Meet the Mayors continue, to see the process that we have evolved here, that I am so, so proud of all of you for being part of this, not only this year, but all these years. I want to introduce uh, Vic Nichols, who is our incoming chairman, um, Vic is uh, CEO of DMC Publishing. Many of you know he published Newark Bound Magazine, a destination magazine for Newark and its surrounding areas. Vic is also CEO of Plios Agency, a sales and marketing mentor for entrepreneurs and small businesses, including my own. Also, a great guy and a fine musician. I and the committee are looking forward to Vic's leadership as we plot our course <coughs> to the future. And finally, I want to thank everyone who I have worked with on this wonderful event for the past 12 years. I am grateful for having this opportunity 
to contribute to our beloved Essex County. Please join me in welcoming Vic Nichols, our new chairman. Again, I'm going to be brief because I'm incoming, okay? Not, you know, in, in the spot now. Those of you in the room who know me know I can talk and talk and talk and talk. So I'm not gonna do that today. But what I am gonna say is I am very, very honored that Denny and Lou and the rest of the committee asked me to do this. When they originally had asked me to do this, um, I said, this is an honor, but I kind of want to see what it's all about. So I spent some time with them on the committee, working with them, seeing what an amazing idea it was, but also the fact that Denny was able to pull this thing off for 12 years in a row. Right. I thought it was absolutely unbelievable. So, in closing, I have no intention of trying to fill Denny's shoes. That's not something that's ever going to happen. And like he said, he's not going away because I won't allow it. But the fact of the matter is, is that I want to hope that we can move this event on and it goes for another 12 or more years than that. Probably won't be me doing it. But that we keep this thing moving. And it's really about the journey, not us getting to a destination because you always move the destination. So I want to keep this thing moving. And thanks to the panel.